many coming through the ranks of academia were told. What are the lies and the truth in such statements? Thank you very much, first of all, for giving me this opportunity. As mentioned, my name is Professor Peter Berechesebeki Bas, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Management, and I'm happy to be here uh, this morning. I want to say this, uh, Abdullahi, that yes. uh, that statement has a lot of truth and a lot of lies. Number one, the truths are that education opens doors. But the lies are, it's not just all education. Education must be planned, must be organized, and must be able to train the child in all areas of life, in terms of cognitive skills, in terms of affective skills, in terms of even spiritual matters, so that the child grows up to be someone who is wholesome. And then as they continue to higher education, they are well grounded. And then also, as we, the truth, a lot of truth is that education opens doors in terms of the knowledge. The kids get the knowledge, the children get knowledge, uh, they get skills, uh, they also get, uh, um, and they also get to know how to communicate and uh, think uh, critically and, uh, and many other skills that they learn. But uh, one thing is that education, academic knowledge, without touching on other areas, mm -hmm. aspects, becomes a problem at the end. We'll it's come to the holistic nature of education a little bit later. But often, failure in school is equated as though it's a failure in life. Is that true? It's not true because failure in school means what? We look at failure as not passing the grade in terms of the examinations. The problem we have had in this country and many other countries is we are so much examination oriented to the extent that when a child does not pass as expected by the parents and the peers at a certain grade, they will say the child has failed. But really this child may have other skills and talents that have not been tapped. So our education system should be able to tap all these other skills. We are only testing the cognitive skills, the thinking, mm -hmm. the writing, you know, the passing exams. And what but is the disconnect between testing the thinking and testing the practicalities that one could propel as well in? The problem I've had with uh, a lot of curricula is that we only teach the, the cognitive skills, the academic. But we don't combine this with discovering the knowledge discovering the skills of these kids, like music, for example, athletics, football, uh, fash, uh, making sure that they learn to uh, use the skills they have in beyond just the academics. And this is where the failure is, because we don't teach that many times. And what ails the culture that you have to go to school to learn so as to be successful? Why is the mindset, mindset rather, over the years become staunch in as far as going to school and learning? is concerned. This, I would say, is historical, goes back to when we got our independence because we thought education was the door to everything. We failed to see that we need to develop the whole person in terms of the other knowledge, the other skills that these children can do. Today we can see footballers doing very well, but we didn't emphasize football. Today we see uh, the musicians, we see the people in media, they're doing very well. We see athletes doing very well. We didn't emphasize this. And education that is wholesome touches all these areas. And this is where we fail. Our parents and that culture was that going to school means you get a white collar job. And that is past because today we don't have those jobs. And therefore we need to look beyond the academics. A friend of mine, as we were having an off-air discussion, told me that we are largely trained to be imitators as per our education system. We are not trained to be innovators. It's, I found that seductive and intuitive. I, I don't know what you are thinking is on that. Thank you. That's a good question because we have copycats. That's another way of looking at it. Look at business, for example. If someone starts a business here, a hotel, somebody next door will do the same thing. The question is teaching innovation and creativity. And this is the core of my education, for example, training. And this is what we're also doing at Zetec University, where when students come in, we give them the academics, yes, based on the curricula that's approved through the various uh, regular bodies. And we also give them opportunity to go beyond the classroom. We have talents that we have developed among students. We have uh, students who have done very well. There's one, for example, who won, uh, who was number one among 4,000 students under our Hawaii project which we have in this country. He's representing this country in South Africa because we gave opportunities to students. There's also another one who also discovered, uh, came up with a smart can, Mr. Mudungu. He's also doing very well. 
and many other areas. There's Mr. Kajado, the lady who won there, was one of our, is one of our students. And so we develop the horse and person. We give them opportunity to go beyond the certificate, the diploma, the degree they get. Fair and enough, Prof. Looking at the system of education, not just in Kenya, but largely in African countries, or even to a larger extent, European nations as well, it's more or less of what we have. The years may be different in terms of 844. The specific years may be different. But generally, it will take 14, 15 years for a student to have done till university, which, make, which begs the question, why has education over the years then become more of a routine rather than something that can evolve with time as well? I want to go back to what I mentioned earlier, that the culture that we developed in terms of rote learning, pass examinations, do very well, go to university, get a job. This is good, but that cannot work anymore. Because today we are looking at developing the total person. The education we should be offering is a lifelong experience where education gives the child an experience to first discover themselves and then develop the talents, develop the skills, so that we are not emphasizing examination. Examination would only be there to measure that they have achieved certain level. But they should not be the end. It should be a means to look at how we can move beyond the culture of you must pass exams, you must uh, uh, look for a job, you must go to university. Yes, university is there, and everybody, I believe, can go to university Fair and can go to the highest level. But we must develop the total person, and we must do some reorientation of the mind, the culture from beginning, starting from primary school, nursery school. Kids should be developed, they learn as they continue at each level, to reach a point where, as they continue developing, they are looking at other skills, what they can do beyond the classroom. Of course, they must work hard to pass exams, to, to meet the standards. But the key thing here is education should be for life. It's good that you mentioned education will be for life because my question would be, how then can education be reinvented to make it as a transformative agent to the individual in a holistic manner? I'm glad that today we have TVET coming in with the so-called Matiangi, of course, uh, rules that uh, reduce the numbers, that pass at the, uh, to KCSE, which I don't believe in, I don't, I don't ac accept 100%. The thing you, is... You don't, you don't believe in... I, I don't believe in having numbers, numbers so be, being so few to go to university or passing a certain grade, a C plus, for example. Out of over 600 kids, students, you're only getting less than uh, 100 passing with C plus and above. That in itself affected the other students. But all is not lost because those who have not done, made the, made the grade, can also go to institutions of uh, learning, go to the vocational technical training institutions, go to diploma, and my university, Visitek University, we have certificate programs, we have diploma programs, for students to be able to develop as they progress from one level to another. All students are not the same. They develop at different paces and given an opportunity. Because these children need an opportunity to be able to discover, to learn, and to move at a pace that they can be able to cope up with. The education system also touches on uh, the training of our teachers, the reorientation. Most of our teachers were trained in the old school where they think about passing exams. The parents think the same way. Unless my child has passed his exam and gone further, I, I, I'm a failure. We should change this and talk about opportunities that are available. And what will it need to change this, Prof? What it requires is training, awareness, that education is not just for passing exams and uh, continuing on, but education is to give someone skills and knowledge to be able to function at any level. This goes into your awareness and the role models that we can see that you can make it even if you didn't go up to the highest level of education, but having an opportunity, you are able to make life or to earn a living and do it decently. Talk of our institutions of learning, and there's a question often of half-baked students, half-baked products. Is it often the institutions themselves or the students who are half-baked? I want to say the term half-baked is misused. In what sense? There's nothing is that is half-baked. What we should say is this. They have not gotten the required skills. And this touches both the training, the teachers, the curricula. The curricula is good. But how is that curricula implemented? The teachers themselves, the lecturers, 
Do they teach as a curriculum and the books, or do they go beyond to give the students an opportunity and then engage them in terms of developing the whole person? What has happened is looking at the historical development of this country where we have been examination oriented. And you can see we have, in the East African region, we are a country that has done a lot of review of, of, of our, curriculum, our education system. Almost three times, Uganda and Tanzania have not done much. Mm -hmm. They are doing their best. But with us, we have reviewed because we looked at what is it that we are not doing. One of the things is a curricula is good. An education system is as good as those who will implement it. The implementation stage is the one that I would want to say has not done very well because we have not reoriented the implementers enough to be able to uh, develop these students and be able to discover how to motivate the students to go to the next level. Uh, the other thing I see also I've seen is the attitude towards the students. By the students. The, the attitude towards the student by? The students, by the teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's some of them. I want to say this. Every student has a talent, has a potential. It is a teacher to discover, it's a lecturer to discover, how do I assist this student to be able to gain that basic knowledge in this particular curriculum to move on. And then look at application. We don't know a lot of application, especially in higher education. And this is where the pendulum is swinging to. Can we move towards competence best? So that students at every level, if a student comes out of a university with a bachelor's degree, for example, in communication, mm -hmm. what is that student capable to do? They are supposed to have learned skills that they are able to interview, they are able to uh, communicate, they are able to uh, work and function in any organization that, that uh, they are prepared for. And also, beyond being half-backed, the question of the question of uh, being said half-backed uh, uh, really is, is neither here nor there. Because they can do something. These students can do something. The only thing is the preparation. They may not have had enough preparation. Massification, for example, we talk of massification of higher education, where you have a lot of students in a class, especially when you come to some of these institutions, mm -hmm. so that the, stu the lecturer doesn't have enough time to, uh, or create enough time to be able to reach every student and assist them to understand the skills, the knowledge, apply this so that they are ready to move to the next level Prof, of the world. What often ails the conversation around half-baked is the seemingly loud disconnect between the theories and what is taught at our institutions and the practicalities that is applied in the various industries. Do you see a disconnect between the two? Not exactly. As I mentioned, there is a question of the theory, the teaching, and the attachment, and the internship, and the f getting students into the field to be able to interact with the industry. There is where there is a disconnect, because many programs we've seen in many institutions don't do this. And this is where we say, when you are implementing the curricula at any level, it must be wholesome. It must touch the industry. That's why we bring in industry players. For my university, for example, ZTEC, we have a lot of industry attachment with, for our students. We have a lot of in, uh, industry uh, linkages where students have time to go to the industry and have the attachment there, the practicals there, the inter internship, we also bring people from industry to talk to our students. And this is where then there is a link between the practice and the theory. And when your students come back to you after these internships, after these programs, do they seemingly as well agree that what we were taught in school is in line with what we are practicing in the industry? Yes. The sessions that come in, the reports that we receive on one-to-one -one with students, they tell us that really these are things that are taught in industry. And this is what we want to do. So they also assist in improving the delivery of learning. And this is what we encourage that every program should have that industry attachment, that industry linkage, so as to develop students who are, not, uh, who are up to the game in terms of getting to know what's happening in industry. But Prof, how do you convince people that young people of my generation or even younger that education is important at a time when they are surrounded by people who have, for the lack of a better word, made it in life, yet illiterate? The question of education, as I mentioned earlier, is education for life. You are not learning to make the money. You are learning to be able to get the skills and knowledge to make you function at every level. As a professor of entrepreneurship, I talk about developing 
the human being, the person to be able to be innovative, to be creative, to be seeking opportunities, and to use the skills and knowledge I've gained at whatever level to be able to make a difference in their life. And this is where the, Swiss, the, the change is, to be able to move towards getting innovation, teaching innovation and creativity and the critical thinking, uh, be able to develop the mind, the young minds, to be able to know that even if these people have made it in life, they still lack something. Because one thing is, you, you, it's not, life is not money. Life is not pre uh, reaching the highest level in society. Life is how happy can you be with the knowledge you have, the skills, and as you generate your income, and you, as you run, you are able to make a difference in life. Life is making a difference in other people's lives. This is what I believe. That your education is not to make money and be able to sit somewhere and say, I've made it in life. It's to be able to interact, to make change in people's lives. Prof, and this is th what we think we should be doing also in our education system. Th that sounds a noble approach to me in terms of education. But seemingly, it's not everyone's approach. It's not majority's approach. Many say they go to school to make a living out of the degrees that they get. Is that first a wrong perception about education? Yes, I would say to a large extent it is. And that's why I say we go back to the development of these children from the beginning. Why do we go to school? We want to gain the knowledge, the skills, to be able to interact with people, to be able to uh, get talents, to discover our talents, to hone those talents, so that I'm able to function wherever I am. Many of our students, for example, when they come out of university or colleges with their diplomas and degrees and certificates, they are going to the first place to go to look for a job. I want to say that's a wrong motive. That was there in the 1960s and 70s. Now, we must be developing people who, when they get out of the college or university, they should be saying, what can I do? I have the, this knowledge, I have these skills, I can plan, I can be able to see opportunities. How do I make use of these opportunities so that I'm able to function at whatever level, whether in paid employment or in self-employment? Prof, that, that seems as though it will call for a different mind shift and a total ball game when it comes to how education is viewed, if at all the outcome of each and every institution is to be that we produce students who think, as you said, of what they can do rather than get into a job market. This is exactly what's happening with the education system when we look at it. Beginning with, for example, the TVET programs, the diploma. They're teaching them how to be practical. When it comes to the degree, we are also moving towards that, towards developing students who are able to function beyond the job market, beyond thinking for a job. And that's why we have entrepreneurship in all the universities in this country, as I talk now. It may be taught as a course, as a unit, but it's being taught. And I would want to see a whole, the whole country thinking entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a way of thinking beyond the box. You know, we are all in boxes. Our education system puts us in boxes. When you think about at the end of this, if I'm trained as an accountant, I want to go and work as an accountant. I want us to move out of there. As an accountant, what can I do? Can I start a small enterprise? Can I be able to assist the enterprises near my community, even even the pro bono basis, as I begin thinking of how to make a difference in other people's lives? And it calls for a reorientation. And that's what's happening in our universities today, that we move towards that. And some of our universities that are doing very well, I want to say, are private universities. They're doing very well in this area. My university is doing that, whereby we are also getting with the community, involving them in terms of moving towards our students, acting to assist them and support them from the knowledge they have gained, be it in ICT, be it in, a, in, in a hospitality, be it in business, to be able to assist the communities. We are working within the real community. This is what we are going to be doing with the Chamber of Commerce, the Campbell chapter. We are working towards this so that we change the whole thinking. Fair enough. Fair enough, Prof, because I asked of the disconnect between the practicality of which you answered. Because this is as well fueled by the question that we have institutions in this country that teach engineering, but our roads are constructed by Chinese. Our businesses, some of the big corporates in Kenya, run by foreigners who have studied in foreign universities, which again begs the question, are our institutions producing what the market needs? Yes, I want to say that. We have the best engineers, best doctors, best teachers. At a time when our roads are constructed by Chinese, Prof, that will be difficult to explain, it, won't it? It is difficult, but we have to rethink in terms of, do we have confidence in our own people? Do we have confidence in our engineers? When contracts are given, are we give, have, do we have confidence in them? And the problem, again, is why the, why the Chinese? We should use them to learn. 
and I have confidence in our engineers. I want to tell you this. I've had the opportunity to travel to other countries, and I've seen Kenyans there doing very well. Engineers, who are chief engineers, superintendents, developing those countries. <laughs> and when they're at home here, we seem not to recognize these people. As the Bible says, I'm a Christian. It Fair says enough. it. And it's a Sunday anyway. And go it's ahead, a Sunday. Go ahead. It says it. Prophets don't, are, not, are not honored at home. We have to honor our own prophets. We have to accept them. We have to give them opportunity. And those who get into corrupt ways, as we see today, that we talk of engineers, when we give them, when they get the contract, the Lord is not finished. I've heard this many times. <laughs> oh, the bridges are not finished. Oh, they collapse. Why is that so? Because we have an endemic problem, which we need to address right from the beginning, to ensure that we have the confidence, we train the right people, we, we, give, them the conf we give them the opportunity, and we, we trust them. And those who, who do things in a shorty way, the law is there to handle them. Uh, Prof, you haven't really answered my question, unfortunately. The question is, we have the best of people whom we can confidently say we trained them mm -hmm. for four years, irrespective of the field. Mm -hmm. We just cited out education, mm -hmm. which begs the question, if we train people four years, five years, and seemingly our job market is decorated by people who are trained elsewhere, doesn't that dint the image of our own institutions? And as far as we could be confident that they are training students? To some extent, I want to say this. I have answered in a different way, but let me put it this way. We have the best institutions, I have no doubt. My colleagues in various professions, in various disciplines, engineers and so on, and medicine and even education, we have the best. And we train the best students. I want to tell you our education system in this country is the best. And it's an envy of all others across the globe. But that trust and the support, I want to also come into support from our own government, for example. If we talk about the Chinese, for example, they are supported by their government. In fact, the money comes from the Chinese government. Are we doing that to our engineers? Are we doing that to our, our contractors? <laughs> this is the kind of thing that we do that it should be seen as the country developing its own people. And it develops it in people by giving them support that they require. And then ensuring that it's the right people doing it and their culture is developed so that we have confidence in our own people. Prof, what is the importance of a vibrant academia to the survival of any country? Thank you for that question. That's a very good one. I want to say this. Academia should be informing decision making. Research that we do at the university should be able to be implemented, especially those that bring change. Because any research we do in our universities, if implemented, a lot of research has come out very well, findings and so on. If they're well implemented, they would be able to make a difference. The unfortunate thing in this country is that the politicians are ahead. They make decisions many times without using research findings, without implementing this. And if we can work together, the academia, the government, the private sector, we can be able to tap the benefits of education very well in making a change in this country. You touched on a question I was to ask, which is on the antagonism that seemingly as well is brewing between the academia, the industries, and the authorities. What will it need to harmonize all these together to feature, prospel the prospects of education, of course, being used as, as a transformative tool? We have to work together. We have to agree as the universities, the forums, the government, we work together with the government and private sector, we have KEPSA and others, that we can come together and say, what can we do? It may call for a national forum. Well, how can we tap into the talents, into the resources we have in the university? Taxpayers' money that has been poured in these universities and a lot of resources that are there. How can we use this? And we must have confidence in our own people that we are able to make a difference. So such a kind of forum and many forums would be able to inform the decision making in moving forward in making a change in this country. Prof, I understand we need to take a short commercial break, but before we do that, I want you to, I want us rather to be a little bit futuristic and paint for me a somewhat picture of what an ideal education system in your own view can be. I want to say this, uh, Abdullah, there is no ideal education system. It's a mirage. <laughs> but what can we use as we have today? Can we improve on the system we have to be able to train our youngsters as they go through education system with the right values? You know, we talk about we lose our values. That's why we see a lot of uh, things, evil things going on. <laughs> How can we develop this from, right from the humble beginning, 
from nursery school, primary school, secondary school, education system that allows, first of all, anybody to develop to the highest level. Number two, the highest level of education. The highest level of the talent of anybody. You know, everybody not, may not go to university, Fair. but they have the skills and knowledge to do, do manufacture, to discover. We talk about manufacturing, for example, this country. We want to move towards industrialization. Who will do it? We have a lot of our people in the informal sector. Are we developing them? Are we tapping this? Do we have a system that can be able to tap these fellows and be able to move them next level? So an uh, education system that is functional, in your words, ideal, mm -hmm. is one that gives everybody an opportunity to go as far as they can reach. Number two, it should be affordable. It should be accessible. Number three, it should look beyond just academic, the, the head knowledge, the cognitive skills. You should go beyond the affective. Develop talents. Develop areas that these students have. We have Nobel Prize winners, by the way, in this country, mm -hmm. but we have not discovered them. We need an education system that can help. Any child anywhere across this country should have an opportunity to reach the highest level. And then the resources should be equitably distributed so that some schools are not lacking teachers or some institutions are not lacking uh, facilities and so on. Mm -hmm. And then this question of private sector, public sector. I want to say this. These are Kenyans. They are taxpayers. And I would talk to the government and say, these are Kenyans, taxpayers. There should be no division between the two. If there are resources given, for example, books or facilities, they should equally be given to institutions that have been uh, registered, meet all the requirements, all the regulations. And this talks about private universities, private secondary schools, private uh, primary schools. This should all the government should look at this in terms of this we are developing Kenyans and we give them opportunities. I like what they did for KCP, where kids from every institution who did very well went to the, the national schools. Fair enough. Prof, when we come back from the break, we'll talk of literacy level, the holistic approach of education in general. We're taking our first short commercial break here on the conversation. Of course, when we come back from the break, we'll delve deeper to matters, uh, the holistic approach and 